Welcome back to the channel. Eric and I are transporting our bees today. We are out in the bog. It's the end of April, so it's a time to move them. We know that they've overwintered and they're okay to make the long journey. Unfortunately though, right now it is also spring breakup. So during this time, we get really warm temperatures during the day, the snow's melting. And what happens is the snow will get what we call punchy around here. So you actually like punch through the snow in the afternoon, pretty much all the way to the base. So if it's like three, four feet of snow, you can imagine that's pretty unpleasant and definitely going to be tricky with our bees. We needed to uh, move them. We need to move them in the morning and that's why we're out here now. I think it's like six just AM. Eric's got them boarded it up and we're gonna get them we're gonna get them over to the truck I, need to bring, I want to bring all their foam um, I'm grabbing both boxes even though only this hive over here is alive and I'm also taking the foam because it's still cold out okay. I think the biggest thing we have to know is to just not Come on, come on. Save the yeah. That's really heavy. Kind of surprising me. Okay. This is completely full of honey. That's crazy. Like, no, there's there's a whole frame. I mean, a whole frame, a whole box of honey in here. Beauty. We have quite a full load for this trip. 
while we were down here we picked up more stuff. Bringing the bees through the bog was about as tricky as I suspected. It was quite difficult, uh, but we got them. We got them here, and we're gonna we're gonna hit the road. Oh gosh. I wouldn't like drag them. Can you lift the back and I can lift the front? Would you lift them or no? Let's just get to the edge until I get out and then we'll. Okay, okay. we're almost at the edge. I think we're there. We're good. Oh, no. Okay. Got it. There you go. Just like this. Just like this. That should work. Or is that good? How about right here? You want to put it right here? Or do you want me to just create a front for them? Well, I want it. You got, you got a little more so you can walk in there, you know? If I spread some ashes right in this front area, it'll probably melt in like a day. Yeah. There we go. That would be perfect. That's that. Conex. This is all of our chicken feed. It's nice and organized and we are going to check on the bees today. It's been about two days since we moved them and we want to assess and see how they're doing. I just have to get our bee smoker in here. Oh, it's right here. Cool. Got what we needed. We went from winter to spring real fast. We hit 50 degrees for the first time since fall last week. And yesterday was in the 50s. And today I think we're gonna be in the 50s as well. Cool water hole you got. <laughs> We are out with our sole beehive. We had one that overwintered this year. The other one did not. This one's doing really great. And I just wanted to take this moment to mention two things that kind of are at play when you're transporting bees. The first thing is it's usually best to move them at night. And that's because there are foragers that come out during the day and they do just that. They forage and they bring back materials to the to the hive. In our case, it's spring in Alaska. So there's still a lot of snow and our bees are not really foraging. Some of them are coming out, but they don't go that far. There's really no pollen yet. So they just come right back to the hive. We took them in the early morning. So I know that most of them were in the hive when we took them and we transported them during the day. But again, you would usually do it at night because the bees come back at the end of the day and they are inside of the hive during the night. There's also another kind of funny rule when moving bees, they say something like you could move them three feet or you have to move them three miles. And what that means is you either have to move them just really tiny increments or you have to move them a greater distance than a few miles. And that also comes into play with the foragers. So the foragers come out and they can go in probably like a five mile radius. So when you're moving bees, if you're just gonna be shifting them just a hair, like over half a foot or a foot, that's not that big of a deal. They should come out and be able to get back to the hive, no problem. But if you're going to move them, let's say like six feet or a mile, the issue is that those bees are probably gonna go back to the old location. They're not gonna know to go to that new location, especially if you move them during the day. So you can tell that we have a shovel here right in front of the hive. And that is another little trick to help them orient. If bees come out of their hive and they see something there like a branch right in the landing area, they will kind of reorient to figure out their way back home when they take off. This is just an extra precaution. But if you wanna know the truth, we moved our bees over 300 
100 miles, so there's absolutely no way they are going to try to go back to the old location. In our case, I guess that wasn't really a big deal, but other times, like this summer, if we decide that this is not where we want the beehive, um, but we do want it in a relatively close proximity, what we'll have to do is do that first approach where we just move it just a teeny tiny bit every few days or so until we get them to where we want them. The move was successful. I was really concerned about it because the road is very bumpy on our way out here, but the bees did well and they are already coming out and doing some of their orientation flights. So I know they're doing good. We're gonna take this all off today and get in there. I'm not doing a full inspection, but I am gonna get them just better set up for the spring, early summer months. What I did was bring some extra boxes. I've got one with honey from the hive that did not overwinter. They actually had a lot of honey left, so that's gonna be awesome for this hive. And then I have an extra box here. This is what I'm gonna be kind of moving that hive to over here. And that's just my way I'm gonna kind of look at them as I do that. We have these little insulation boards on the side. So we keep, we keep those in there in the winter. They have Reflectix and a little bit of insulation on the inside. Eric made those for us. It's still cold at night, even though it's spring here. So uh, we are gonna leave that insulation in there for a little while longer. They're filling up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cracks. That's a really good size. Okay guys, it's okay. We're getting you a new home. <coughs> See all that mold they're gonna have to clean out. Make it all the way there. Wow. of bees. This is the bottom board and it's just completely full of bees that didn't make it. This is really just typical, totally normal. And we have an extra bottom board that's cleaned off. Now, so we're going to swap it out. Got a lot of bees on this one already. The bottom board is swapped out and so is the second box underneath them. I gave them quite a few frames with honey and then I also gave them just a few empty foundation so the queen can lay. Every time I check on our bees, it's something different than I expect. So they actually look really great. Um, I'm not gonna mess with them further. It doesn't make sense to do it. Clearly they're doing well on their own. I am just gonna add a little bit extra pollen down here. They are going through the pollen at a pretty good rate. I'm gonna put the candy board back on top. I think I've decided that I'm gonna make some fondant inside, which is just a different type of uh, sugar food for them. And then we're just gonna kind of close them back up for the day. The pollen patty I just gave them is the substitute for the real deal since there's no pollen yet. I'm just gonna get them closed back up and then next time I think I'll have my bee suit out. I'm pretty sure I forgot that. <laughs> When we picked up our bees, we also made a trip out of it. So we brought the trailer and we picked up a lot of stuff. So when we went to get our things for the chicken coop build, we forgot some materials. So we picked that up. These are the rafter vents and the insulation wire. So we're all ready to do that. We also realized on the chicken coop that that thing pretty much needs a whole new roof. So we've got metal roofing and some lumber to redo the roof on it. We also met up with Jason, our solar guy. He owns Long Spring Solar and he met us in Wasilla and we picked up our whole entire solar system that we're gonna have out at this property. We're super excited about that. We're not gonna get into the specs on it right now. We will more when we go to install that thing. We do have a solar system at our old place. It's just a little small. And we kind of want to go a different direction with this new property. We have been running the house just off of a generator. So hopefully we can get that solar system installed sooner than later. And we got a huge stack of panels on the back that are going with the solar system. We have a few other little things, a piece for the Quonset hut, some stuff for the chickens. Lastly, we picked up some more stuff for the plumbing of our house. So this is a pan, a, a water, Water heater drip pan and we have some pipe insulation we've been having a couple issues inside we're gonna try to fix that today and first actually I think we're gonna get this whole entire trailer unloaded
Careful with this. I can hold it if you want while you go down. Go down, what you get? Go down. Welcome to the bathroom. We're absolutely loving our indoor plumbing, but it is giving us a couple of issues. So we're getting something that's called sweating on our pipes and on our pressure tank. And this has really only happened one time to us. And it's when Ariel was doing laundry. So she puts her little washing machine in the shower and she uses a shower head to fill up her little laundry machine. And she was using quite a bit of water. So the well water was coming out of the ground really cold. It was coming into the pressure tank and it was sweating because the air in our house was a little bit warmer. It's not really an issue when we're just doing like daily stuff, but when Ariel was doing the laundry and she was running the water for a long time at once, it got pretty bad. So it was dripping all over the subfloor in here and that's just OSB, so it's not protected. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna try to fix it the best that we can. So we're gonna wrap all that pipe down there with some pipe insulation. And then we're also gonna put a tray underneath the pressure tank. That way if it does sweat, Hopefully the sweat will just fall into that tray. It's not gonna fall into the ground and rot our ground. It sounds pretty easy, but there's one little thing we have to consider. The water heater is sitting right here on this piece of wood and it's got like the pressure tank completely sandwiched. So there's absolutely no room uh, on top of this pressure tank. So I think what we're gonna do, we're gonna try this first. Hopefully we don't have to completely remove the water heater is I'm gonna drain all the water out of the water heater, get it to be a little bit lighter. I'm gonna drain all the water out of the pressure tank and I'm gonna undo all the screws on this plywood and I'm just hoping that I can kind of wedge this piece of wood up, stick some shims in there. That'll give us enough room to lift up that pressure tank about two inches and we can slide our drip pan under there. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna hook up a hose to our water heater and we're gonna drain the water out of her. There it goes. Okay. I think it's working. Oh wow, that's nice. You can take a bath out here real quick. So we'll drain the hot water and uh, the tank will be light and we can move it around and we're gonna drain the pressure tank next and we'll shut off the well pump so it doesn't fill back up on us. Perfect. Yeah, you can see. See that? That's a little bit of like a powdery mold from the water. That's just, you know, that's just from it one It just time. happened. From yeah. The... 20 minutes of that. We clean up the mold with some vinegar and there's a little bit of moisture in there. So we're going to let the fan run for, I don't know, until it dries out. And I'm thinking we might get some condensation on the bottom of the pan. We'll just see. Hopefully, hopefully it doesn't condensate too much and it gets the floor wet. But let's get it dried out before we put it in there. It's two pieces of wood. So we're gonna have to lift two, we'll see. Okay, only a drip. This will crack, this is ceramic. You go straight down. Well, we ended up pulling the hot water heater out and we've dried out the area. I've lifted up the piece of plywood. We now have about, I don't know, about two inches to work with. We're gonna try to put the pan underneath the pressure tank. And then we also have a sheet of like a bathroom wall plastic, this waterproof stuff. We're gonna try to slide that underneath that. Hopefully that'll help with any condensation and let's see how that goes. Can I put my hand in here? Or not? Okay. I wish I made more marks for you for like uh I know what's for you. Well, after slight modifications to the pan, we bought the two inch one. It looks like we should have went with a one inch. 
Errol trimmed it up for us. It fits. We got the piece of plastic under there. Let's get the water heater put back in. We can fill everything up with water and then we're going to start insulating the pipes. Well, we're back up and running and I think we did a pretty good job down here actually. It was pretty hard starting off. It was a pain moving that hot water heater around and it's really tight in here, but we got all the main pipes that were sweating a lot and we used this really sticky kind of like foil tape and the pipe insulation. All we can do now is next time we do laundry, we'll see if we got any other spots that uh, are sweating and we'll cover those ones up too. But all in all, we're ready to go again. This afternoon, Eric and I are starting on a fun sprouting project. I've got some seeds and grains right here that we're gonna be trying to sprout. The chicken's food right now is a mixture of a whole bunch of things that we compile and they get this awesome feed and we soak it sometimes and we also ferment it. So if I'm just bringing it in, add a little water, let it soak overnight, I would call that soaking it. And fermenting it is where you actually go through a little bit more of a process and it starts to ferment after a few days. So we have never tried this for the chickens. This is called sprouting it, and if you let it go long enough, it is considered fodder. We love sprouting seeds for ourselves, so I am guessing that the chickens are also going to appreciate this, and it's really, it's a very similar process to the way we would do it for ourselves. So I have some black oil sunflower seeds. I have whole barley which alaska grows and then we have some yellow whole peas and then i also have a bag of lentils lentils are supposed to be very economical and simple to sprout for chickens for our experiment we're just going to be trying one cup of each of these and we're just going to see how it turns out i imagine they will grow at different rates and i'm going to start by putting just a full cup in a mason jar quart size and do that with all of them Something I was just reading up on, which I found pretty fascinating, so I'll share it on to you. Uh, you have probably heard that sprouts are healthy or they are more bioavailable. That's why we ferment our chicken feed. But I read something that really like registered with me. So if you think about a seed like this, they are dormant. That's a pea seed. And they have a hard coating on the outside. They basically have all their nutrients and energy stored in there. And it is not until they sprout when the environment or the conditions are right that they release that energy and those nutrients. So it's really kind of the exact same concept when you are eating sprouts. You are getting all that extra benefit from the sprouted seed. And lastly, we're gonna add a cup of lentils. We've got seeds legumes and then grains and i'm going to add three cups of water to each of these we have to let them soak at first they're probably going to go overnight and then i'll drain them in the morning and we'll pick back up with the process Good sometimes we let our fermented chicken feed go for a hair long and i'm pretty sure i have seen the sunflower sprout but i'm pretty excited for all of these we need to punch a few holes in these little mason jar lids that we have. You could use cheesecloth too. I just don't have any on hand right now. So we're gonna get some holes punched in these. And that's not for the soaking part, that is for the next step. So maybe like, yeah, probably like however many you think. 10, five. We're just gonna put these aside and get started on making some sugar fondant for our bees. We've got everything we need out for this and I have made this once before. I don't know if it worked 
white right but the bees still did eat it so right now the bees have a candy board they have had that for all winter it's kind of like a backup in case they run out of honey or their stores and that's really similar to a sugar cube so it just has a little bit of water in order to kind of harden it and other thing that we feed them is sugar water and that is like simple syrup but they are not taking that down right now so fondant is just another form of food for them and supposedly it is a little bit easier for them to break down and use so that is why we are going to make it for our recipe i'm using five pounds of sugar two cups of water and a little bit under a tablespoon of vinegar and i'm going to add the water to this dutch oven we're going to get it heating up I'm gonna put about half of that sugar in now and I just wanna slowly melt it. Once it's clear and actually dissolved, I will get our candy thermometer in there and we will keep track of its temperature. We are at 180. Our thermometer's in there and we are looking to go to 240, which is soft ball candy so pliable still really soft and at that point i'm going to pull it off the heat and let it cool down still got a little bit more to go though yeah that's perfect it says you want it to like uh flatten out like that little trick i was reading was you can put a drop of this in some cold water and then pull it out and if it flattens that means that you are had it to the right temperature so it's cooling down now and we are going to be immersion blending it until it reaches the right consistency when it hits 200 degrees well i have some good news it worked this time it looks just like it should it's a good consistency i'm going to get it to a cookie sheet eric lined it with some parchment paper and then we're going to throw it outside for a little bit. There you have it. This is our sugar fondant and it's going to harden as it cools. Two tips. I would be careful when you are letting it come to temperature. I had quite a bit of headspace, but as it increased in temperature and got close to the 240 mark, it started foaming quite a bit and we almost had an emergency on the stove. And then also I think we kind of jumped the gun a little bit, probably could have let it cool a little bit before I tried to get it off of that paper. So we ended up with some of the paper and bits, but we got it all out of the actual sugar. It looks great. And I'm going to get started on dinner for us. For dinner, we are making a fancy mac and cheese. I actually just made this the other day. We don't make pasta that often or mac and cheese, but this is really good with the ingredients we add. So I'm gonna be adding heavy cream. I've got some of that fermented honey that we made. And then we've got some hot pepper paste. I think last time I used some hot sauce. And then we have those salt cured egg yolks from last week, and those were really good in here. And then of course, I forgot the cheese, so I've got probably like half a cup of cheese. I'm going to save some of that for the top. We're actually going to be putting this in some sourdough bread bowls and then baking it. This is the last ingredient I need before I get everything mixed. And that's what we're looking for. It is absolutely delicious. It tastes like sweet and spicy mac and cheese. Really good. Check those out. They look awesome and I'm not gonna lie. I did not put them in the sourdough bowls last time, so we just had the mac and cheese, but we topped them with a little bit of caramelized onions and a few other ingredients, the cheese and the egg yolk, and you could totally do whatever you want with them. Um, make them however you want, but I anticipate these are going to be delicious. Turn around. Some extra pasta. Oh my. Almost looks like french fries. I don't know yet what to do with the garlic. 
mm. this stuff. Who puts honey on their mac and cheese? This fork is made for a child. I like the little one because then you can savor your food more. Look at that. Wow. If someone walked out and showed you that, what would you say? Hello? Say bring it on. Nice to meet you. You worked hard today. Too hard. Too hard. Much too hard. <laughs> Good morning. We are checking on our seeds that have soaked overnight. You can see that the peas swelled up quite a bit. They almost take up the complete jar. And we are going to drain these now. I'm going to fill them back up with anywhere from one to two cups clean water. Just give it a little swirl and then I will be having them drain into a container. I want to water them or get them moist at least once a day, maybe twice a day if I find that they're drying out too much. And we're just going to keep doing that process until we start to see them sprout and they get to the length that I want to feed them to the chickens. These are the barley seeds. And I think a lot of people in Alaska use these, so I don't think we'll have any trouble with these ones. I'm just using a little band on the bottom and that kind of keeps it at an angle. Okay, the lentils were the last ones in there. I have these in a sunny window. It only gets probably half day worth of sun, so you can definitely do them in a less sunny area, but I'm gonna try that and see how it works and I will keep you posted on what happens. Thank you. 